one of the more enigmatic, even puzzling characters in Philip K. Dick's The Man in the High Castle is this person that portrays himself at first as an Italian truck driver and war veteran, Joe Kinadella. And all of his interactions are, well, except for the very first engagements with Juliana Frank, one of the main characters. And we get to see who he actually is, not only through her eyes, but through the revelations that he makes to her. But it's quite interesting because he will, over the course of their discussions, make a lot of quite impassioned declarations to her about who he is and how he relates to her, which all turn out to be false. And we could say, is he just really good at his job as a Nazi agent? Or does he really believe some of this stuff until he doesn't believe it? And there isn't a, a clear answer to this in the work, I would say. So we, we encounter him first when Juliana is getting herself uh, something to eat at this lunch counter. And, um, you know, she's looking at Tasty Charlie's Broiled Hamburgers, uh, reading the menu. And uh, there are these two truck drivers that come in and uh, we, we see this. Um, they took pleasure in noticing how attractive she was. Even lacking the fry cook's kidding, she would have found the truck drivers scrutinizing her. The months of active judo had given her unusual muscle tone. She knew how well she held herself and what it did for her, for her figure. And uh, the fry cook warns the truck drivers, stay away from, from her. She'll throw you on her can. And she talks to them and she says, where are you two from? And they both say, Missouri. And she says, are you from the United States? I am, the older man said, Philadelphia. I got three kids there. The oldest is 11. And then she says, is it easy to get a good job back there? And then the younger truck driver, this is Joe, says, sure, if you have the right color skin. He himself had a dark brooding face with curly black hair. His expression had become set and bitter. He's a wop, the older man said. This is a derogatory term that's been used for Italians for a very long time. And then <clears throat> Juliana says, well, didn't Italy win the war? She smiled at the young truck driver, but he did not smile back. Instead, his somber eyes glowed even more intensely. Suddenly he turned away. I'm sorry, she thought, but she said nothing. I can't save you or anyone else from being dark. And then she asked the truck driver, are you going back on the road tonight? And he says, tomorrow. And, and she says, well, if you're not happy with the U.S., why don't you cross over permanently? I've been living in the Rockies for a long time, and it's not bad. I lived on the coast in San Francisco. They have the skin thing there, too. Glancing briefly at her as he sat hunched at the counter, the young Italian said, now this is very revelatory of his mindset at the beginning, lady, it's bad enough to have to spend one day or one night in a town like this, live here, Christ, if I could get any other kind of job and not have to be on the road eating my meals in places like this. And then the older truck driver says, Joe, you're a snob. And Juliana says, you know, you could live in Denver. It's nicer up there. And so they're, you know, talking back and forth then about uh, the war and, uh, uh, you know, the, the Nazis and, and the Japanese and Judaism. And then uh, we find something else interesting. So this is a little bit later in that third chapter. No one noticed her, Juliana, except the young Italian truck driver. His dark eyes were fixed on her. Joe, his name was what? Joe what? Uh, she wondered. Closer to him now, she saw that he was not as young as she had thought. Hard to tell. So there's something special about him, she's going to decide. The intensity all around him disturbed her judgment. Continually, he drew his hand through his hair, combing it back with crooked, rigid fingers. There's something special about this man, she thought. He breathes death. It upset her and yet attracted her. And then uh, basically there's, there's a hookup, right? And there's some exchange of uh, uh, commodity goods, nylon stockings, right? This is sort of an old tired thing. 
and she agrees to drive him to his motel. As it turns out, that's not what they actually do. They go back to her place. Now, there's a lot going on there being foreshadowed in this first chapter, but then we pick it up in chapter six. Juliana goes out, does some shopping, comes back, finds him still uh, in bed, right, laying where she'd left him in the center of the bed on his stomach, his arms dangling. He was still asleep. No, she thought, he, he can't still be here. The truck's gone. Did he miss it? Obviously. And then she asks, did he intend to miss it? That's what I wonder. And then we get this interesting reflection about their sexual relations. What a peculiar man. He'd been so active with her, going on almost all night, and yet it had been, a, it had been as if he were not actually there doing it, but never being aware, thoughts on something else, perhaps, from habit, she thought. Uh, maybe he's done it so much, she decided it's second nature. His body makes the motions like mine now as I put these plates and silver in the sink. And then he wakes up, and they begin talking with each other. And she learns about Joe's story. She sees a tattoo, asks him, what's that blue letter C? Is that your wife? And he says, Cairo. And she thinks, wow, what an exotic name for a wife. As it turns out, that is the place where they were engaged in a terrible battle, right? The German and Italian veterans of that campaign, that was their bond. The defeat of the British and Australian army under General Gott at the hands of Rommel and his Africa Corps. She finds uh, his possessions and he's got an iron cross. And so they begin to discuss the war, the Ethiopian campaign that his brothers had participated in. And he tells her some of his story. Um, he at 13 had been in a fascist youth organization in Milan, his hometown. Later, his brothers joined a crack artillery battery. Uh, when World War II began, Joe had been able to join them. They'd fought under Graziani. Their equipment had been dreadful. The British had shot them down, even senior officers like rabbits. And it goes on and on and on. She asks, are your brothers still alive? And he says, his brothers have been killed in 44 strangled with wire by British commandos, the long-range desert group which had operated behind Axis lines. And they talk about Britain, and he says, I wish that they would do to the British what they did in Africa, you know, basically genocide because of all uh, of the, the fighting, right? And then they begin to talk about this book, The Grasshopper Lies Heavy. He pulls out the book, and he says to her, uh, this is very funny. You know, what would it be like if the allies had won? And he begins, you know, uh, telling her about some of the aspects of it. And then you get to see the bitterness again in here. He says, um, you know how it is that England wins, beats the Axis in the book? He has Italy betray the Axis. Italy goes over to the allies joins the Anglo-Saxons. We all know the cowardly Italian army that ran every time they saw the British drinking vino and happy-go-lucky not made for fighting. This fellow, Abinson, I don't blame him. He writes this fantasy imagining how the world would be if the Axis is lost. How else could they lose except by Italy being a traitor? The Duce, he was a clown. We all know that. And so, you know, again, we see this, well, didn't Italy participate? Yes, but it's a minor partner compared to the Germans and the Italians. And he's getting her hooked into this book and its possibilities for the world being differently. And so they're, they're sitting there in the, the place and discussing a lot of other matters. They're listening to the radio and he tells her a bit more. Uh, I've been living under the Nazis. I know what it's like. Is that just talk to live 12, 13 years, longer than that, almost 15 years? I got a work card from OT. I worked for Organization TOT since 1947 in North Africa and the U.S. And he says, listen, I got the Italian genius for earthworks. OT gave me a high rating. I was helping design an engineer. And he goes on and talks about Dr. Tote came by and said, you got big hands. That's a big moment. You got good hands. That's a big moment, Juliana. Dignity of labor. They're not, they're not talking only words. 
Before them, the Nazis, everyone looked down on manual jobs, myself too, aristocratic. The labor front put an end to that. I seen my own hands for the first time. And he goes on and talks about how you know great it was. And Juliana says, all your idols, they just came in after hostilities to clear the rubble, build the autobahns, right? She's thinking this to herself. And then they come back and talk about the grasshopper. And she says, how did you read the book? It's banned. And he says, well, I read it secretly in the toilet. I hid it in a pillow. In fact, I read it because it was banned. And she, he says, it's easy for you people here. You live a safe, purposeless life, nothing to do, nothing to worry about, out of the stream of events left over from the past, right? And she says to him, you're killing yourself with cynicism. Your idols got taken away from you one by one, and now you have nothing to give your love to. And I think that is quite true. She's perceptive about who this person is. And um, a little bit later, there, you know, he says, this is all just empty talk that we're doing. And she says, if you feel that about me, why don't you go on? What are you staying here for? And then we get an interesting foreboding. His enigmatic grimace chilled her. I wish I'd never let him come with me, she thought. And now it's too late. I can't get rid of him. He's too strong. Something terrible is happening, she thought, coming out of him. And I seem to be helping him. And they go on and they're, they're discussing, um, you know, what would happen the night before. And he says, you're scared of men, aren't you? It was possible to tell last night only because I took special care to notice your wants. And she says, because you've gone to bed with so many girls, Juliana said, that's what you started to say. And then here we get one of the first declarations. But I know I'm right. Listen, I'll never hurt you, Juliana. On my mother's body, I give you my word. I'll be specially considerate. And if you want to make an issue out of my experience, I'll give you the advantage of that. You'll lose your jitters. I can relax you and improve you in not much time either. You've ha just had bad luck. So as it's going to turn out, he is not going to refrain from hurting her. And we pick up an interesting discussion while they're driving and while she is reading this book. And they discuss culture and the Nazis. Um, and this is, is quite important. Um, he is going to, again, make some declarations about how bad the uh, Nazi regime actually is in terms of music, in terms of uh, literature, right? He says that the, you know, um, I'll tell you who a great conductor was, Arturo Toscanini, but he was Italian. The Nazis wouldn't let him conduct after the war because of his politics. He's dead now. I don't like that. Uh, you know, we have this Von Karjan, permanent conductor of the New York Philharmonic. We had to go to concerts by him, our work dorm. What I like being a WAP, you can guess. Uh, Verdi and Puccini. All we get in New York is heavy, bombastic Wagner and Orff. We have to go every week to one of those corny U.S. Nazi party dramatic spectacles at Madison Square Garden with the flags and drums and trumpets and flickering flame, right? And they talk about books and they talk about other things like that. And then she goes back to reading uh, The Grasshopper Lies Heavy. And uh, interestingly, Joe is going to talk about um, how the world ought to work. He, he, they're talking about Churchill, and he says, Churchill was the one good leader the British had during the war. If they'd retained him, they would have been better off. I tell you, a state is no better than its leader. Führer Princip, principle of leadership, like the Nazis say. They're right. Even this Obinson has to face that. Sure, the USA expands economically after winning the war over Japan because it's got that huge market in Asia. It's wrested from the Japs. But that's not enough. It's got no spirituality. Not that the British have. They're both plutocracies, ruled by the rich. If they'd won, they'd have thought, all they'd have thought about was making more money, that upper class. Obinson, he's wrong. There would be no social reform, no welfare, public works plan. The Anglo-Saxon plutocrats wouldn't have permitted it. And Julie 
Juliana thinks, spoken like a devout fascist. And then he says, listen, I'm not an intellectual. Fascism has no need of that. What is wanted is the deed. Theory derives from action. What our corporate state demands from us is comprehension of the social forces of history. You see, I tell you, I know, Juliana, all those old rotten money run empires, Britain and France and the USA, though the latter is sort of bastard side shoot, not strictly empire, but money oriented. They had no soul, so naturally no future, no growth. Nazis, a bunch of street thugs. I agree. You agree, right? She had to smile. His Italian mannerisms had overpowered him in his attempt to drive and make his speech simultaneously. And we go on and he says, you ever read what the Duce wrote? Inspired, beautiful man, beautiful writing explains the underlying actuality of every event. Real issue in war was old versus new money. That's why Nazis dragged Jewish question mistakenly into it versus communal mass spirit. What Nazis call Gemeinschaft folkness, like the Soviets, commune, right? Only communists sneaked in pan-Slavic Peter the Great empire ambitions with it, made social reform means for imperial ambitions. And Juliana thinks to herself, like Mussolini did, exactly. And then Joe says, Nazi thuggery, a tragedy, but change always harsh on the loser, nothing new. Look at previous revolutions such as French or Cromwell against Irish. Too much philosophy and Germanic temperament. Too much theater, too. All those rallies. You never find true fascists talking, only doing, like me, right? And she says, God, you've been talking a mile a minute. And he says, I'm explaining fascist theory of action. And we read, she couldn't answer. It was too funny. But the man beside her did not think it was funny. He glowered at her, his face red. Veins in his forehead became distended, right? So this is quite interesting. He seems very, very committed to a particularly Italian understanding of fascism, saying that the Germans got things wrong. And, uh, you know, he's, he's certainly taking this to heart. Then what else happens during this drive? He proposes that they actually could meet Abinson, but he lets Juliana sort of come up with the idea. She says, Joe, it's only another hundred miles. We could, you drive so good. It would be nothing to go on up there. And she says, you know, um, why not try? All he could do is send us away. So they decide that they're going to like, you know, clean up, get some new clothes, get a haircut, and then they will go up there. And very interestingly, Joe has agreed to this and he says, I'll let you decide all the details. I know you can do it. Pretty girl always gets everyone. When he sees what a knockout you are, he'll open the door wide, but no monkey business. He he wants to pretend that they're husband and wife. But now notice this, everything will be up to you, but it won't. Just like the, I would never hurt you, but he will, right? So this is part of the contrast in his character. Now in chapter 13, they actually get together in uh, Denver and Joe, you know, they pick out clothes and stuff like that. And then Joe gets a haircut and he's also dyed his hair blonde. And when she asks him about that, uh, the, you know, he says, I'm tired of being a WAP. I, I don't want to be cast as a lower class person in this racial hierarchy, I'm going to be something different. But as we're going to find out, he never really was an Italian to begin with. And Joe announces that, and so here we see him changing the story. They are going to go on after they eat dinner, uh, rather than staying there for one or two or three days like Juliana wants to, and then going on to see Abinson, They're going to go on tonight. It's important that they take off. And, you know, Juliana is quite disappointed about this. Um, She balks at it. It's too late tonight. And, and, you know, she says, why? So, and he doesn't answer, right? She says, I don't want to go and see him tonight. I'm not going. I don't want to at all, even tomorrow. I just want to see the sights like you promised me. And as she spoke, the dread once more reappeared and settled on her chest, the peculiar blind panic that had scarcely gone away, even in the brightest of moments with her. And he says, no, no, we'll, we'll do it. He spoke reasonably 
and yet with a stark deadness, as if he were reciting. These ways in which he talks are very important. And then what we find is that Joe threatens Juliana. He actually tells her, put on the dress or I'll kill you. And they begin to spar back and forth verbally. Uh, he, you know, she thinks to herself, he fought these British commandos, but maybe my judo training can prevail. And he says, I know maybe you can throw me or maybe not. And she says, not throw you, maim you permanently. I actually can. I lived out on the West Coast. The Japs taught me up in Seattle. You go on to Cheyenne if you want to and leave me here. Don't try to force you. I'm scared of you and I'll try. I'll try to get you bad if you come at me. And he says, oh, come on, put on the goddamn dress. What's this all about? You must be nuts talking about killing and maiming just because I want you to hop in the car after dinner and drive up the Autobahn with me and see this fellow whose book you... Now notice, he uses the word Autobahn there, and she begins to figure things out. And part of it is the valet service and, you know, what's going on with shirts. And he says, she says to him, how did you know a new white shirt can't be worn until it's pressed? And she starts putting it all together. She says, did you really have your hair cut and dyed? I think your hair was always blonde and you were wearing a hairpiece. Isn't that so? And she says, you must be an SD man posing as an Italian truck driver. You never fought in North Africa. You're supposed to come up here and kill Abinson. Isn't that so? I guess it is. I, I guess I'm pretty dumb. And Joe says, well, I fought in North Africa, but not with party's artillery battery, with the Brandenburgers. I was a Wehrmacht commando, infiltrated British headquarters. And uh, she says, is that fountain pen a weapon? And he says, no, it's a two watt transmitter and receiver so I can keep in radio contact. And, he, and she says, you're not Italian, you're a German. And then he says, Swiss. So he's, he's a Swiss Nazi commando who now works for the uh, Sicherheitsdienst, the SD, right? And they even have a whole folder on Abinson as he reveals. This folder says that he's attracted to the kind of woman that Juliana is, right? A sort of vaguely Near Eastern, dark hair, certain kind of figure. And so this entire thing has been Joe using her to get to Abinson. And Juliana is going to have a break into mental illness. Um, he's, you know, trying to offer her pills and she starts sort of you know, babbling. Hair creates bear who removes spots and nakedness, hiding no hide to hung with a hook, the hook from God. Hair, here, her, pills eating, probably turpentine acid, right? And um, Joe looks at her and uh, says, um, you didn't take the pills. You're very sick. We can't go. I can't take you to Abinson's. Maybe we'll try tomorrow. She goes into the bathroom again and she comes out with a razor blade. And then we've got this very interesting description. Uh, As she opened the corridor door, he exclaimed, grabbed wildly at her. Whisk! It is awful, she said. They violate. I ought to know. Um, and she says, let me by, don't bar my way unless you want a lesson. Holding the blade up, she went on opening the door. Joe sat on the floor, hands pressed to the side of his throat. Goodbye, she said. She goes out naked and the hairdresser's like, oh, honey, you're so drunk, you better get back in the room. So she goes back in the room, starts getting dressed, and Joe says, listen, you cut my aorta, artery in my neck. And she says, you got the words wrong. You mean the carotid. And he says, if I let go, I'll bleed out in two minutes. You know that. Get me some kind of help. Get a doctor or an ambulance. Do you, you understand me? Did you mean to? Okay, you call or get someone. And she says, well, I'll think about letting them know at the desk. She packs up and she leaves. And the end of this whole story of Joe comes in chapter 15, when Juliana is reading a newspaper in the downtown business section, she stops at a cigar store and bought two afternoon newspapers. Parked at the curb, she searched until she at last found the item. So here is his 
essentially his obituary. Vacation ends in fatal slashing. Sought for questioning concerning the fatal slashing of her husband in their swank rooms at the President Garner Hotel in Denver. Mrs. Joe Kinadella of Cannon City, according to the hotel employees, left immediately after what must have been the tragic climax of a marital quarrel. Razor blades found in the room apparently were used by Mrs. Kinadella, described as dark, attractive, well-dressed and slender, about 30, to slash the throat of her husband, whose body was found by Theodore Ferris, hotel employee, who had picked up shirts from Kinadella just half an hour earlier and was returning them as instructed, only to come on the grisly scene. The hotel suite police said showed signs of struggle, suggesting that a violent argument had, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And very interestingly, she reflects, oh, they got my name wrong. They got both of their names wrong, right? Because Joe Kinadella, it clearly isn't Joe Kinadella. He is this Nazi assassin. She's Juliana Frank. And that is where his story ends. How much of what he said did he actually believe? We don't actually know. We just know what he did say. We know the things that he committed to, clearly just to put Juliana at ease and use her, and he winds up being killed in the process. 